for the last, I can see the very last flickers of energy. The last lecture in the fall series with Jan Edler. Uh, we're very fortunate to be able to welcome Jan here for his first Chicago and his last evening in the U.S. Jan has been on a tour of uh, U.S. lectures at Penn, Buffalo, UCLA, Cooper Union, and, and now in Chicago. Uh, so we're very pleased to be able to delay Jan's uh, getting home to Berlin for another evening. Um, also, especially want to thank uh, John Choa and E3 for uh, co-sponsoring uh, this evening's lecture. So we want to thank the uh, Architectural Alumni Association for helping to make this possible. So thank you to E3. Uh, just a couple of facts and we'll get into the lecture. And hopefully the final pressure will dissipate and more people will come down from the studio. Jan studied architecture at the Technical University in Aachen and then at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. In 2000, Jan co-founded the Berlin-based firm Realities United, or Real U, uh, with his brother Tim. Uh, soon after uh, founding the firm, they realized what I'm sure most of you know is the internationally acclaimed light and media facade house uh, in Graz. Uh, in addition to uh, Peter Cook, uh, Realities United has also collaborated with Bjarke Ingels, Kuhn Himmelblau, Norman Foster, and a uh, string of others uh, in terms of extending the possibilities uh, uh, and methods of architecture as a medium of communication and information relay. In addition to those collaborations, Realities United has won the Hans Schaefer Prize from the Association of German Architects, the Golden Nail, which is the English translation, uh, the highest award given by the Art Directors Club, and the work has been exhibited in many exhibitions, uh, including Venice Biennale, uh, the Future Design Museum, and the Kunstmuseum in Stuttgart. In addition to practice, Jan has also taught at the TU in Berlin and the, and the Pasadena Art College Art Center in Los Angeles. Um, uh, given that it's the end, we won't belabor this uh, anymore and get to the main event, but just to say that, uh, that uh, Jan and Tim's work I think is very um, significant for some of the research that's happening at the school, in particular on the issues of architecture as a community medium and the way in which it uh, solicits and engages.
first experience in the professional work field and so on. Architects, artists, designers and so on. And um, it kind of it kind of shows a bit why we started our office really this um, Basically at that time we were interested in phenomena um, which we would fake by combining like the real world as plain architects we are interested in. surrounding us. So in a way it shows um, maybe like this um, futuristic um, idea for having a um, computer interface or a user data in space. It's very abstract but on the other hand it leads to developments which we are facing right now. Similar things are going on. Uh, I'm sure you have seen that uh, the imitation of the Berlin Castle in Berlin, which is supposed to be reconstructed. So here, the city, at least a certain amount of people, um, believes the city should reinvent itself by looking at images from the past and using them and re-establishing them by by reconstruction. Uh, things like that are happening on other levels, shopping centers. Then there is more. Um, direct things which are surrounding us, the redefinition of marketplaces. Uh, in history, marketplaces used to be uh, clearly things which were implemented in the urban fabric and were part of our life in, in the city. Uh, now they're moving towards electronic platforms and um, we are facing a development where we can see that, uh, at least for certain products, um, the idea to the idea of a showroom where you look at the product and then you, then 
when you buy it somewhere else because it's cheaper. Yeah, and obviously the the uh, implementation of moving uh, images um, for advertising. So um, seeing all that happening uh, surrounding us, we believe it's a it's an intelligent way of expanding architecture to those fields. Um, because if you don't do um, it's, the expansion to that area, someone else will do it. And uh, we also believe it's intelligent to um, find new territories to claim uh, to be part of architecture. On the other hand, we always have that developing the architects rather complain about the fact that they lose influence in certain areas. So we have all those evil people surrounding you, like banks and clients, and you have an army of uh, special consultants telling you what not to do. And uh, so we think, instead of kind of putting your hand, uh, your head in the sand, it's, it's intelligent to take areas which have not been claimed by architecture yet. And other disciplines are clearly looking at areas like that, um, advertising and so on. We have seen that. And uh, funnily enough, it's also um, other disciplines taking over the term of architecture for um, their uh, work. So it's like the um, IT architecture happening not being produced by architects but by other people and uh, the architecture of the union reunification and so on and so on. So it's not so clear what architecture really is and um, maybe that gives you a hint a bit of uh, where we are coming from. Expansion can be, uh, first blooms can be very literal. Uh, this is a very old project I'm showing here from 2001. It's called as much as in and out, and um, it's uh, well, it's a, it's, it's a balcony substitute for city apartments which don't have one. We as architects believe you always have the possibility to sit outside, especially in Berlin, it's very important because the summer is very, very short, so you, you need to make use of it. And you find um, it looks kind of funny and um, Basically, the project was developed rather on the level of exploring the legal limits of architecture than to make a statement. So that's why the construction is carried all the way to the inside underneath the window and is not touching the facade. In this way, it is kind of um, positioning that device outside um, the influence of building authorities or landlords because um, you're not doing something wrong, you know, it's only temporary and uh, you're not hurting um, the architecture from the outside. And looking back, I mean, it's an old project now, looking back, seven years, back at that time, it was an excitement to, to look at the political dimension behind that project. And today, sometimes we believe it is kind of also into what was going to come afterwards in our practice, which is about communication and architecture, because maybe it's more like a one pixel media facade. Um, because I imagine that anyone who would buy a device like that is quite into communicating with the neighbor. guy came with our six heavy duty wall plugs which we kind of had estimated because there was no money for a structural engineer and he placed four of them in the wrong place and we had to cut them off so we were left with two we didn't want to risk his life so that's why we chose to attach the drone later on Coming back, um, I, I touched the notion of, of um, <coughs> communication. Uh, um, you've heard like our office, the first project which got kind of well known is uh, Bix, um, communicative display scheme for the cruise house and guards. Most of you will have seen that, so I, I just want to give you like a rough idea how that whole project started because it also gives you an idea of how our office developed in a way. So, 
Um, we got into that project in 2001, just about two and a half years before the opening of the scheduled opening of the building at that time, and we got a commission which was called um, Commission for the Integration of Media Technology, and nobody knew what that was supposed to be. The um, commission was triggered by the architects um, who wanted that building to become really modern and uh, incorporating all kinds of media technology and so they told the client, who was the city of Graz, why don't you get someone to look into that? And so, so there was a commission but we, nobody knew what the result was supposed to be. So we um, developed that rather broad catalog of ideas and one of the ideas we developed as, as part of that was um, to transform the eastern facade of that building to become some sort of communicative display screen and the reason for that was because the architecture was not really delivering anymore what it was supposed to, um, because uh, obviously the building is being cladded with acrylic glass, which you can see here, but it's not transparent anymore, so due to um, cost issues and technical issues uh, regarding cooling and heating the place, this tra transparent notion was kicked out of the project by that time. So um, we were left with a black box being covered with transparent material, and we thought, we should look at some possibility to bring back that transparency even in a mediated way. So the proposal at that time was to integrate a field of 930 fluorescent light tubes, which you can see here in one of the first drawings. This is during installation, being covered with the acrylic, and that's the final result. So basically um, you can control each of those light sources individually and um, can dim it quite fast, um, about 18 times per second. And um, in this way, it transformed that skin to become this very core resolution grayscale display as a communicative device for the consumers as an institution. Um, a few of the design aspects we were looking at, um, which are important to mention scale, what you can see here, the red rectangle marks the surface, which we could have been treating using LED technology at that time. Uh, so we were looking for a technology which would be cheap enough to to grab the whole building, uh, it needed to be integrated in the complex geometry. Um, we wanted it not to be showing up in daytime, so hiding it below the acrylic was kind of nice. Um, we wanted character, uh, since it's an arts institu institution, and we wanted to kind of also make them uh, need to produce special content and not be tempted to just take anything which is, which is there already. Aging was an issue which we kind of uh, looked at um, because media technology tends to grow old at a very um, fast pace, much faster than architecture does. And so we were happy to use something which is old already. And uh, when you approach the Kunstfahrt, you notice that you're familiar with that device. And uh, maybe it's more that edge of uh, the, the pacing architecture and pacing media technology. One last aspect which got really important and which is uh, driving us till today is um, software development for projects like that. And back at that time it was um, an experience for us to see that we did not uh, have the tools to design something like this. So we were wishing to have tools which would allow us to um, envision how things like that would look like, dynamic things like that would look like. Um, without waiting for renderings to come out of the computer the next day. So um, we decided we need software which allows you to um, to uh, enable the, the, the artists, uh, which are here the ones who are supposed to deliver the content, to envision how it will look on the specific building. So that's the pixels you have, that's a movie on the com computer desktop, and now you try to imagine how it looks in the city context, which is literally um, impossible. So um, we developed um, two software things. The first one I'm going to skip due to time reasons. If I can find my mouse somewhere. Oh, here it is. Uh, it's an administrative tool which allows you to schedule programs for days and weeks and so on. And the more, more important one is called Big Simulator, which is a simulating environment which you download and basically use in order to see how your production looks while traveling on the map through graphs. So it's a quite flexible tool. Um, back at the time it was rather high tech. Today we, we can improve things like that, but it, it, didn't, it, 
enables you to basically show everything that quick time understands and it even has a programming interface so you can do your own list with your own software to control those pixels individually. So uh, coming from there, getting a lot of publications for that project, um, which was kind of nice, then our office went really downhill and our telephone was never ringing. Um, and we thought it should be the other way around, but nothing happened. Um, and um, nevertheless, we got other projects I'm going to show you. Um, it took a while, uh, it took a while. Um, but we were kind of triggered by what we had experienced in Graz, and uh, we got interested in that idea of what, what are dynamic um, surfaces in architecture, what, how does architecture behave when it becomes something which is not static anymore, but rather a process or a choreography. Uh, and obviously there is images we all know uh, which are coming from the past and is it those images which are mostly are derived from the idea of television being mapped onto architecture are those the ones which are um, the foundation of what will happen surrounding us because I mean the technologies for transforming architectural surfaces are emerging and uh, other industries are very interested in that. So, um, we, we kind of um, got into that process of looking what is a pixel in architecture, how big is it, what, what shape has it, and so on. So, the first testing ground um, uh, we had for that is a temporary installation at Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. So, it's a completely different background, an existing building with a double layer facade, rather ugly, and because it's rather ugly, uh, the, the building has an image problem, it's on the, on the wrong side of Potsdamer Platz and it belongs to a, a major European bank and um, uh, th there was this advertising agency who proposed to them to engage us to develop a media art installation for that facade in order to find a tenant for the building somewhere in the world basically to make the building famous in some way it was a very, very short notice commission. Um, as I said, it was temporarily, so we were not allowed to change anything in the facade, but really not to drill a single wall. And uh, there was no time for real development, so we were stuck at that time, uh, coming from the grass project, being put in the draw. Uh, please do a copy of that. And so we had to find our own territory uh, to have some fun, basically. So um, here, that whole development about defining what a pixel. Uh, could be an architecture um, came up. Um, we were damned to use fluorescence in that case because uh, there was no time to look at other technologies. Uh, one thing we did was to shift the grid in that case, um, as we have seen in the slide before and here. So here is like the installation in that existing facade is a double layer facade with glass um, on the exterior and uh, a regular window based facade behind it, which I think typical thing coming from the Berlin um, Stimmann area. So Stimmann was the one defining how Berlin looks quite a lot after the wall came down and there were certain, certain rules about the amount of glass you were allowed to, uh, allowed to have in the facade. So here the architects um, I think wanted to have glass but weren't allowed to have glass so they put that fake facade in front of it. Um, yeah, so you see how it looks like. Uh, we started mixing different pixel formats. It was not only circular fluorescent light tubes, but also um, pairs of straight ones. Looking at different densities, distributions of pixels within the facade, color became an issue because the facade is transparent and not translucent, but we knew that we would need some sort of light distribution in the facade. Uh, based on the 30 degrees we introduced to place the pixels, we uh, and needing color and color being visible at daytime. We got into daytime design, uh, looking at tessellation patterns, which we found was interesting, studying MC Escher and things like that, developing loads of those. That was more or less like the final shape, which you can see here. And since um, I skipped, I skipped uh, showing a movie about the, the Graz project, um, I'll show you a few moving images with that one. Here, um, the, the, 
project here, it's 1800 fluorescence, so it's double the resolution of we had in, what, what we had in, in grass. So for our conditions, um, that's quite a lot. It's still very, very little, and it still requires you to produce special, special content, um, especially regarding that strange shape of the screen. As you can see, it's not like 4 to 3 or 16 to 9, but this is um, the shape. Like an icon which is visible at daytime. And um, here the facade, similar to the Graz project, um, was used as a platform for artistic productions. The difference is that here was more money because the bank was a client, so basically a, a set of curators were um, commissioned to then again commission artists to produce pieces. And those pieces were shown for four weeks each on the facade. There was a whole big discussion about showing commercials on there as well and we had a, a long, long, long discussion about telling them it's not a good idea to show commercials if you want to market the place because the press will not write about it. So there was only four weeks during the 18 months um, when the installation was up there, when it was used for commercials and that was the Soccer World Championships, um, which we thought was okay because it was um, everything was crazy during the time. And uh, so it was within limits, you can say. I will, I'm going to um, skip talking about content at that point in detail. I'll, I'll get back to that later on. Uh, scroll through there a bit so you get the idea. Um, and then moving on. Sorry for pushing time-wise, but I'm just uh, having done so many lectures now. I know that I have too many images. So, <laughs> yeah. So here's a list of artists who were involved. Uh, the most famous one actually, um, most most famous one. Oh yeah, Terry Gilliam was the most famous one who took part. But actually, I think his piece was really shit. Didn't work at all. Well, anyhow, um, continuing from there, what is a pixel? Uh, there's a lot of experiments going on. This was like, for instance, I just chose to, to show those images, although they are completely taken out of the context, context, but I kind of like them because they show how to look at um, the technical side again. What does what does the pixel do to like the readability of an image, different densities, orientations, and shapes of pixels? Here um, in collaboration with Christian Müller uh, for an airport in San Jose, but the project is not happening. Uh, a very short notice project together with Mass Buddies, Min Sok Cho from Korea, and a temporary installation which was up for five days in Seoul this year. Um, absolutely crazy and it didn't work. Um, and then kind of moving towards projects where we're gaining territory. Uh, one project is called Iluma. The working title was a UEC for Urban Entertainment Center. A project we developed for uh, Wuha Architects, a young Singaporean-based um, practice. Um, quite big, they're doing a lot of residential projects. And they approached us with one of their first commercial developments in Singapore. It's, um, it's supposed to be a mixture of shopping, nightlife and restaurants. Uh, in the Bugis district downtown Singapore and they approached us with a design where like half of the building was cladded in glass in front of like a non-transparent wall and they told us well we, we did that so you can put your fluorescent light just behind that. So that's a typical thing that happens to us if you're once pigeonholed. And so we um, persuaded them luckily to give us a budget for the glass facade and told them uh, why don't we try to develop something which is uh, a bit more architectural and um, we don't have that stupid glass which doesn't do anything besides hiding fluorescence and we developed a system um, with three acrylic or not um, uh, plastic elements really uh, which you can see here in the early rendering um, uh, so you have those three elements we call it the main pill the angle and the tap and by adding them to each other you have this modular system to cover the facade, it's an undulating facade in different densities and configurations. Those pills come as an intelligent version, how we call it, in the non-intelligent version. 
the uh, difference basically is that the intelligent ones uh, kind of know or have the capability to show medianness because they have compact fluorescent light tubes inside um, in a density uh, of six at the most in one of those main pills, but there's also lower resolution ones. And they come in different print um, densities. So here's a 1 to 10 scale model uh, which we made for the client. So you see part of the um, pills are treated with a print in order to distribute the light again, which is in those areas. And you have the clear ones. And you get the idea of uh, that um, obviously by those um, aluminum reflectors on the inside, which you can see here in scale 1 to 1, in early prototyping are not there only to reflect um, artificial light, but also the sunlight at daytime. So again, one to one prototyping in the office, one to one prototyping in Singapore. So that's more or less like the final, final thing. Um, here's like a main three hub color. So this one has not seven pixels inside, but only three. And that star shaped reflector and. That's how installation looks like in Singapore. Those images are about three weeks old now. So um, you see, this is like printed uh, pills, half printed, non printed. They come in those different densities, quite large. We, are, uh, we kind of like the project um, looking at details, and you might wonder that I haven't shown um, a single image of the whole building yet. I can't deny that I uh, always keep that to the last image because. Some problems still to be involved. I mean, um, it's our first project in Asia, so um, we we had to learn a lot um, regarding communication. It is really hardcore. This is the biggest project we have ever done, budget-wise, and also regarding the complexity. Having a system like that being produced in Asia already is a nightmare, and. Um, Having introduced a system like that, we were very much into um, developing a whole set or bunch of connecting details to the architecture behind it. And I think we have failed in a lot of areas because we're just ignored. Um, so what you can see, for instance, one thing we were very disappointed about, we have a orthogonal construction behind it because the involved structural engineers said it's not possible to shift it by 30 degrees. Those directions, and there's a lot of things like that, which in the end kind of makes it a bit different, a bit difficult. Um, but you see, like the, the, the pitch black wall behind it, which uh, hopefully becomes repainting as well. And that's a building, and I, I, I think it's really amazing to look at it because it's, this is not two buildings, it's one building made completely new. So that part up here and that part are one development, which is I think unthinkable in our dimensions. So this part is containing all the shopping part and restaurants and nightclubs, while this part contains theaters, multifunctional space and parking. Another project uh, where we also kind of gain in space and become more a part of the um, like the real facade design, we can say, is collaboration with Nito Sabacano architects. Uh, uh, also rather young practice uh, from Spain. They participated in a competition for a media arts center in Cordoba in Spain. That's a competition entry uh, which uh, helped them to win. So they got first prize and, and as you can see uh, uh, the outstanding element of that design is that strange structure which is being used to organize the floor plan and also to bring in daylight into the exhibition spaces. That's a location. Just to give you a rough um, orientation for everybody who knows Cordoba a bit, this is the old part of the city, very beautiful. This is the location where the Media Arts Center is going to be, and this is the location where OMA is supposed to make a conference center. Uh, they have won the competition, but right now I think the project is on hold due to the economic situation. But we are lucky enough um, that our construction has started. So it's not going to be stopped anymore. Um, that's also photographs taken of the competition model. And what you can see is the architects proposed as part of the competition entry to have the eastern facade, which is this, to be a media facade. 
um, how they called it, and they kind of got some inspiration from our practice, I guess, by shifting the pixels by 30 degrees. And it's a concrete facade, has circular holes in it, and basically <coughs> carries circular fluorescent light tubes being behind it. So we didn't know about all that, and they approached us after winning the competition and asked us if we um, could help them to um, look at the facade. We said yes, but we think it needs some reorganization. Uh, so we are happy, and the project is happy. And um, we decided to look um, at the inner structure as a basis for what we uh, were doing there. Um, we used those similar algorithms to organize the facade in pixels with different densities. The background of that is that the proportions of that facade are very difficult. So you can imagine we have a lot of pixels which can be parked in that direction, but only very few in this direction, which gives you a setting which is extremely difficult to show content. So we came up with that idea of mixing scales. So the facade has like a high resolution area, which is here, and it has a lower resolution parts surrounding it. And um, here we're using basically a trick that the human brain helps you to decipher what the whole image is showing because it, um, but while having a reference here, it helps you to read what's happening here. I'll show you show that in an animation so you get an idea in a moment. Um, yeah, and obviously, I mean, the, the shape of the pixels came from that inner organization. Um, first renderings, skipping to the, to the model. This was the first models which were being made. And um, this is the second thing um, we proposed is to um, indent the facade um, because we knew that perforating the facade, it's a concrete facade, would leave you at night with a black facade with bright dots inside and we rather need the light on the facade. So we indented it, it's glass fiber reinforced concrete and will be lit from the side, which you can see here. So they work as light reflectors rather, rather than um, emitting light directly. That's a 1 to 7.5 scale model which we were allowed to make for the Swiss Architecture Museum, which was kind of nice. It happened after the design was for us for the testing ground to see how it works. And um, that was the first concrete uh, uh, model which was made. Um, as you can see, it's, it's wrong because it has holes here which shouldn't be there, but you get a sense of the finish. Uh, should be achieved there. So it's going to be white colored concrete, uh, possibly even a bit lighter than what we have here. And um, now you get a sense of what I was saying, moving towards like the whole facade design in a way, since it's again similar to the um, project in uh, Singapore I've shown, a thing which is not only uh, there at nighttime but also daytime, it has a very strong reference towards local architecture. Um, in Cordoba. And then at night time it becomes um, that working stream for the artists working on the inside. So regarding content here, it's a platform idea. Again, just a few moving images on that. Uh, that's the wrong position to stop. If I stop it here, you, you kind of get a sense of what I was talking about, those different resolutions. So here we have a higher resolution area. You can decipher those lines quite clearly. While here and here, it's basically fragments of lines. But looking them in moving images, you see that your uh, brain does a trick somehow and helps you to read the image. It's similar to the construction of the human eye ring because you have clear vision when you look straight ahead, but you have blurred visions on the side. Yeah, so uh, that's a very slow project and we'll speed it up uh, to the end. It's slow, it's supposed to be completed by 2011. I just want to show that last bit of the animation uh, showing the sun cycle so you get a sense of the, the different depth which has been achieved uh, by the texture of the facade. Which I kind of like. language a bit. Um, we have started out doing all those projects with platform ideas, which is a typical thing to do, I guess, when you start out doing work on that edge. But 
we are moving more and more towards projects uh, which we are delivering with content. Um, we think, besides the whole idea of uh, looking at the formal aspects and the, the idea behind the pixel architecture, the content is really like the, the most essential one. Uh, we just have no experience till today, and even the few ones or the few examples we have in the world right now are um, those are the first steps of, of seeing what is the building really saying when it has this dynamic surface. And in the end, we believe it should be an architectural matter and not so much of a matter of advertising or um, even fine arts. Um, and I think it's also still funny to see all those architects out there proposing media facades all over the world as part of competitions and uh, not mentioning what they're being, uh, what, are, what are they used for and what images are they showing. Um, I remember when I, at least when I was studying, there were so many architects out there getting really mad if someone puts up the wrong curbing in the building and suddenly people are coming there and put those huge moving images on the facade and they don't care. So we believe we should care and um, also having made the experience that you shouldn't expect too much answers from the art world because they, um, also the art world is very much driven by formats which are surrounding us. Uh, an artist has only very limited interest in producing special content for a special format because it's a lot of work and an artist prefers to produce content for a 4x3 or 16x9 television screen because you can reuse it. So um, we should rather be the ones looking at that. i show you a few examples where we have moved towards that direction. As I said, I think it's still like first steps. Another project we're doing in Singapore with the same architects, again a commercial development in Singapore. And the, um, the situation for this project was that we had a finished building design and the building design was featuring a high resolution commercial screen on a corner, uh, which the client wanted. It's a commercial client from Asia Capital Land in that case, so um, they do things like that. And they wanted us to do something artistic surrounding it. And in the beginning, we were kind of like, oh, wow, you know, what, what can we do to that because advertising is so evil. And then we kind of thought it's a chance because we have content delivered uh, here free. Uh, we don't have to take care of it. And why don't we use the content which is there and rather, rather try to concentrate on developing something which would work as a translating unit because uh, between that high resolution screen which is programmed there to suck up all your attention and to forget about the architecture and rather try to invent something which brings back the notion of architecture and um, makes you not forget that there's a building surrounding it. So that's a rough proposal in first renderings from 2006. Basically what we did, we opened the facade which you can see here by implementing a, a glass facade um, with um, uh, office windows behind it. Um, the outer level of the glass facade carries an array of 500 color pixels in that case, which are used as projectors and which project against the rear wall. And the office windows in the rear wall have roller blinds which are automatically lowered when you're not in the office. So um, it's like a mixed use thing and the installation um, negotiates between those two interests. And the most important part, it's not very architectural in the sense of construction, but the most important part of software in this case is a piece which is called Wilkie Edge Processor which takes the live signal displayed on the high-res screen in the regular mode, which you can see at the top, uses a set of analysis and algorithms to alter the signal and to create this artistic aura surrounding it. And then there's two special modes, which you can see down here. Uh, this is called recursive mode, uh, which is for all times when the advertiser himself agrees that his advertisement is shown an extra time for free, and they love free stuff. But in, in a shake hand situation, we are allowed to use the same algorithms to alter their commercial. So it's only partable, uh, part readable in the end. But it's shown full length. And then uh, there's what we call dream mode, uh, which is for all times when no commercials are for screening. 
Uh, in the advertising world, you uh, talk about pretty images in. Um, so the advertising industry usually uses things like National Geographic and so on to fill those gaps in the program. So the screen doesn't um, stay black. And in, in dream mode, basically, um, it's a full video synthesizer. Our machine memorizes everything it has seen in the past. So it's like becoming this ever-growing video archive and puts it together um, to this very abstract um, video art piece, you can say. So that's um, the, the physical installation is finished. Um, here a detail of how it looks. So those horizontal bars, which you can see here, slightly staggered. Those are the LED units projecting to the real. Uh, put a lot of development into the reflector design to have those uh, very square projections. A detail of recursive mode, so you can see that uh, the high res screen is being influenced by what's going on in the low res. Um, and here you get a sense of this translation, even if the image is not very good, but um, uh, making the image become part of that overall architectural thing. Um, the layering of information, so here someone enters the office and the roller blind automatically goes up and the LED units in front of the window, window are deactivated so it's not disturbed and you can work and you kind of get a sense of what's happening and inside that building. That's dream mode. Um, I'll give you just a glimpse of how it looks like. As I said, it's it's um, it's still kind of not really finished, so it needs a fin finishing touches on the on the software. But you get the idea. It's very hard to take images and video of things like that, by the way, because uh, you always will have problems regarding the um, the lighting. So if you concentrate on the high res screen, the rest will be uh, dark, and the other way around. So it's like one of those first steps towards a program which regenerates itself all the time um, based on those algorithms or those set of algorithms which offer quite a big bit of variety and obviously the content changes all the time. So it makes it altogether that always kind of changing thing, which is kind of nice. I like it most when it's not covering the whole facade, but rather does things like you can see here, where it's kind of really negotiating between high res and low res, and um, we sold it to the client at the beginning as an architectural advertising amplifier, and um, I think in a way it's not really amplifying the advertisement, if I'm honest. You know, it's, it's rather taking away quite a bit of um, attention from the advertising itself, so if you in front of the, book, the, the, the facade, rather becomes that um, overall installation and not, not so much the, the commercial screen. So in a way, from the architectural perspective, it works quite well. Let me scroll a bit towards one point where you see the roller blinds working, which I really like. So you can see that here. So it has a very simplistic robotic element in there. Another project regarding content um, and not involving light this time, we're also doing things without light, yes. Um, it's a project called Museum X, which we did in München Gladbach. Uh, we're very proud of that project. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, this is the background of the project. Um, most of you will probably know that. It's the famous museum at Thalberg by Hans Hollein. And um, it's a very, very special building, a very special museum because it was one of the first museums in the world um, developed and understood as being a catalyst, so not any more that um, treasury box in the city, more or less disconnected from the city, but rather working as an interface with the city um, uh, and uh, informing, being informed by the city and reinforming the city surrounding it. 
And um, that's also one of the reasons why Frank Gehry, for instance, is always referring to that building as the breeding point of the Bilbao effect. Um, so it is kind of like an important place, although you might not know much in Gladbach itself. It's this very small town, um, a bit west of um, Düsseldorf and Cologne. Small town, 250,000 inhabitants. And they're, they're not doing particularly well. Uh, it's a quite ugly city. Um, was destroyed a lot during the Second World War, and um, they couldn't handle their uh, the stuff they they um, were, were keeping from that time. And um, this is the former theater building, which is just a few hundred meters away from the museum. We got a commission by Susanne Titz, who's running the museum at Thalberg and Mitchell Lambert, and she commissioned us to develop a sign for the museum because the museum had to be closed. It had to be closed because it needed renovation. So it was off the, off the city platform for about a year. And she was afraid, since visitor numbers were going downhill already, she was afraid that this year of closure would kind of do the rest. And she proposed that we should do a sculpture representing the museum um, uh, and use this building as a platform. Um, the top image, I mean the lower image shows the pride, it was a pride at a certain time, it's a, a building from the post-war area. The top image shows the building when we came to Mönchengladbach. We know the area very well because we were both raised in Mönchengladbach. And so the, the, the theatre had been abandoned for about six, six or seven years and we were having quite mixed feelings about being asked to work on that building because the building is very, very political. In a way, it's like the Palace of Republic in Mönchengladbach, uh, because the politicians in the city want to give away that building for free to a company called ECE, which is Europe's biggest shopping center developer. And they promise to do an investment of so and so many million euros in order to heal the city center of Mönchengladbach. And then there is the other side of people saying, we can't give away our cultural property and so on. So. Um, Touching that building for a project like that was programmed to um, cause conflict with, with the political side of Mönchengladbach. Um, we went through that and we made a very simple proposal. We turned around the commission, not doing a sculpture for the museum, but doing a museum as a sculpture. There was no budget, so um, based on that political struggle, the city was not investing any euro in that project, and the whole money had to be raised, uh, fundraised uh, in Mönchengladbach, mostly from industrials or art lovers. A very simple thing we did, we borrowed a pebble concrete from the Academy of Fine Arts in Berlin, applied the facade to the building, which you can see here, so it's um, frames which are about five meters long and two and a half meters high, which are covered with textile, and the textile has a print of that pebble concrete. 65 of those frames. We have this lettering on the facade saying museum. We have a big flag on top of the building and we inserted a small foyer inside. And we cleaned the plaza in front of it. So that's suddenly you mentioned Lapa had that museum which they were looking for since a long, long time. The um, Museum of Thalberg was opened in 1981. And I think if you would have asked someone in 1981 which museum they would have preferred, they would have clearly gone for this one because that was the image of architecture for those people. Um, so in a way, looking at the architecture language, it's an anti holine project, but looking at the program, it's very pro holine A glimpse of the foyer on the inside. So it had everything a museum has. It was open six days a week from Tuesday to Sunday, but it didn't have a single piece of artwork inside. So it was empty, it was 65,000 cubic meters of empty space. But the, the project got so much momentum that the mayor of Mönchengladbach opened it as the new museum of the city, which you can see here. Although no art was inside, he didn't mention that. This is Susanne Titz, the director of the museum. This is my brother, by the way, cutting the red ribbon. And uh, something really spooky happened because this museum had more visitors than the uh, Hans Holland Museum. 
So um, it became the catalyst for this discussion in the city about the future of its inner city, city center. So in a way, this is very much media architecture. It's just presenting one image um, for uh, a period of one year, uh, not changing, but um, it is this media-esque element in the city and working as such. So it's also very much in contradiction to those images I've shown from Leipziger Platz in Berlin, where they imitate architecture to present or to stage advertising, but not producing any sort, a sort of um, city life uh, behind it. Um, I think I'm, I'm just kind of doing this one very quickly. The competition we did this year with Bjarke Ingels, who I think was here last semester. Uh, we have enjoyed that very much. She approached us for a competition in Abu Dhabi um, for a temporary art structure, um, which uh, was an invited competition, so it, I think it was Shigeru Ban and Big. Big is like the free ride ticket in that competition. We did not win, by the way. Um, and um, it's a temporary structure which is supposed to be up for 15 years, about to work as an announcement of those museums uh, to come up by Zaha Hadid and so on, on that huge museum development in Abu Dhabi. And Bjarke's development was looking at a structure of those boxes which you can see here elevated above the ground uh, to uh, form that uh, shadowy uh, huge area below. Um, and he invited us to uh, come up with some sort of solution to look at the communicative capacity of that building, long distance things and so on. We invented two things for the project. Um, one which we call uh, TriVision, again, uh, or which is called TriVision, it's not our invention, that name. Uh, it's just reusing a technology coming from the advertising world. Again, here it's a facade without any windows. It's triangular tubes which have been used for staging free advertisements. We just um, glue them up and scale a lot. So if you look at the person standing, or the, the people standing below, you see that those triangles are really, really big. And the only thing which we change here is the notion of color and material. So it's communicating with the architectural elements which are usually used to communicate to the outside. Um, but very powerful and very monolithic in a way. So it's uh, becoming this very large color changing structure. Uh, so that's more like for the, for, the, for the intermediate distance of that project. And the second element, more playful, is what you can see above. It's a cloud. Uh, here's a, the detail of that thing. We even developed a mechanical solution to go around the corner with those transition elements. And the second element, is a cloud. Here you can see some images from the design development from our practice um, where we were looking at the idea of having a long distance sign and providing shadow, um, looking back at Bjarke's design, shadow to the entrance courtyards which are placed on the upper level. So you come from downstairs from the shadowy exhibition, outside exhibition, move upwards to the courtyard and the courtyard is being shadowed um, by a cloud which moves with the sun, so it's a flying structure. And then we got into ideas of you can walk on clouds and so on. We kind of thought it's nice to have a cloud on the double. But I haven't got so many clouds. This brings me to the end. Uh, anyhow, um, anyhow, because that is something we're very much interested in right now, is using what we call anyhow technologies. Um, technologies which are part of architecture but which are usually not used to form the aesthetic expression of architecture. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into detail this installation, but if for artist space you'll understand a bit more why I actually wanted to show it, but it's, it's a lighting system uh, as a sculpture in that case uh, for a room in artist space in New York um, which lights the room and um, shows the minutes of the hour at the same time. So it's a mixture of information display and lighting device. Um, and it, it's more or less developed as uh, something which is coming out of this Nix project. Nix is a German word for nothing. And um, that has been a research project we have been working on for quite a while now and which 
we then further developed as part of the European Central Bank project of Co-Pinded Law. And this is uh, clearly about any hot technology in this case, and you have beautiful examples of that in Chicago, if you look at all those high-rise buildings. The lighting systems in a high-rise building, which is fully glazed and which has office use. So um, we are interested in using those um, as some sort of choreography uh, to be staged to form a three-dimensional lighting volume. Um, first, I want to show you a very early rendering how this might look like and work. So that's the desk. By stacking them on top of each other, you understand why I'm talking about this lighting volume. So it's rather like this very abstract thing. And um, this was like the very first renderings, also in the time where we had no uh, European Central Bank Commission yet. So looking at imaginary architecture, in this um, case, we, we invented those high rise buildings to make understand, understandable what we're talking about, not having the capabilities of visualizing it really yet. Um, but, but we chose uh, three buildings in that case in order to illustrate that obviously it would be a perfect project to incorporate several buildings at the same time. And then for the European Central Bank, we um, had the chance to further elaborate on that and to develop specialized software to visualize it. This is a music video, I'm going to show it as a music video as well. Otherwise it kind of loses part of the quality. So that's the board member's presentation to persuade them to do that in, um, in Frankfurt. The, the background really of that was that Koppimmelblau was afraid of the big euro sign which could be requested by the board to be put on top of that high-rise building in Frankfurt. Officers cannot participate. It's always also between those different interests. It's 22,000 pixels um, each other. It's 22,000 light sources rendered. And that was the, the software we developed to make um, possible without having a rendering farm. And to kind of imagine what it looks like because. Uh, a three-dimensional object moving in space, movie objects in order to control it, but you actually have to model again to trigger those things going on. Here the content of all of the activities of the European Central Bank so this will be put in there and to please support members. Um, it's, I think it's not happening for several reasons. I don't want to go into detail. And so happening right now is like this research of the high rises being produced in the world and to see and talking to the architects and see if they have an interest um, which has also been part of the world, to see some offices um, in uh, high rises uh, so it's like in cleaners <laughs> but, but we want to I mean, we have been investing so much work in that now and um, it's not true it's not it is very much we know how to do it, so technically it's solved and it's cheap. Um, if you look at the impact, you, you actually hardly need any technology for that. It's more like an intelligent way. So I think that explains any hard technology uh, nicely. Uh, yeah, I, just to currently class a few images from this um, commissioned by Vitra Design Museum. You all have the promises of uh, modern architecture, transparency. And we were commissioned by other architects from the world to look at the uh, how the 
possibility of the future look like, or how it might And being intrigued by this idea of transparency that we're experiencing in climates like Berlin, where you know, because it's, uh, you have glass, but it's due to this climate problem, we were looking at the possibilities to, to change that. Uh, so you kind of need chemicals or you need to ventilate your space partly, and that's what we really want uh, our market to, to be connected to that. The fact that human beings um, in buildings today need it for the whole space altogether, but if we look at different beings, we need only a uh, different one to be um, used. So uh, here you see what is vine or running produces and so on. And the project is about um, a future where you will have the possibility to have a pixels analyzing your uh, body behavior that heats you, uh, and which basically you will look at architecture in a new way by positions um, in areas where you wouldn't have a school. That's the way we store the uh, units. Very fashionable. Um, it, it does not only um, open perspective of architecture, but it also brings down energy consumption. So, on the left hand side is a regular house, in the middle is an energy house, on the right hand side you have that house where you climate or fully climate control central zoning, and then you rather have zones surrounding it like different comfort. And it's a bit like with hot water, the room can be quite cold where you're sitting. And then we were sponsored by Fala, which is this company of little toy houses for train systems. We used to illustrate how architecture could make use of this, which might be interesting and, and inspiring. Thank you.